Welcome to Creation in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Carl Ball, founder and director of the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. The title to today's program is Crunch the Numbers. Now, there's so much information to be given in this program, I'm sure we'll not finish all of it in the first, so this is Crunch the Numbers number one. Now, there's a reason for the particular title and the special guest to this program. The theory of evolution is assumed to be factual, is embraced by the academic community worldwide as being a factual analysis of calculation. Let's put it to the test. Let's crunch the numbers and see how well it fares. And as a special guest capable of doing this, I've invited Professor John Hefner, 38 years as a career mathematician, 35 of those as the uh, professor of math at Kilgore High School, over 20 of those as the head of the math department. Simultaneous with the last 13 years, he was, has been and still is adjunct professor of math at Kilgore College, a man well qualified, a graduate of Texas A&M University and Stephen F. Austin University. I welcome my dear friend and colleague, Professor John Hefner, it is such a pleasure to have you back. Thank you. It's good to be here. I think you and one other guest have appeared more times as my guest on creation in the 21st century than anyone else. Perhaps. <laughs> well, that shows the respect that I have for you, that our museum has for you, and the response that the audience gives to you because you communicate. Well, I hope that's all true. You and I were discussing before the program that communication not only involves our having something to say, but having compassion for the person so that we're not trying to simply say what we want to say. We want to communicate that to him. That's right. We have no vested interest in these programs other than to just impart what we think we understand and uh, so that for the benefit of someone else. <clears throat> and we want to communicate this evidence. That's right. As you and I have discussed before, uh, we have much in common. One of the things in common is that we began years ago uh, with an embracement of evolutionary theory. And uh, you felt that evolution was supported by data uh, and embraced it to some degree. So did I. I was taught that it was factual. I embraced it at a point in my career. Uh, but then the facts didn't really stack up well. Well, and it's, it's tough being an evolutionist these days because information continues to come in that confounds that, that 19th century theory. As we move forward in the 21st century reality, it's getting harder and harder, as I see it, to prop that theory up. And that's one reason the academic community has actually set laws and boundaries uh, around which evolution can be criticized. It is not an open discuss discussion in the classroom. Well, you would think America would be a bastion of free thinking and open ideas, but it's odd that this is the only theory of science that needs laws to protect it from competition. And uh, we say well, it's time to uh, just let the public know the truth. What's wrong with the truth? And that's what we're trying to communicate on the program. That's correct. So uh, we want the audience <clears throat> in. We're, we're here to communicate information. So. The theory of evolution uh, is essentially spelled out in the Tower of Time, published, of course, professionally and embraced by the evolutionary community. And it's the concept that about four and a half billion years ago, the Earth uh, was created naturalistically as a spin-off, a nebular hypothesis. And about three and a half billion years ago, early life evolved in the form of bacteria. Uh, but, Professor, it's amazing, as we probably will get to later, bacteria are incredibly complicated, and they must have other biological systems or once living systems for them to thrive on, otherwise they find their demise. So instantly we run up against some problems with evolutionary theory. But this is assumed to be true. So about three and a half billion years ago, according to that theory, we have the early development of bacterial forms and then subsequent forms in what we call the Precambrian and the Cambrian Paleozoic era, dim, distant past. And then we have the graduation of crustaceans, sharks, 
and then conifers, and then we have the introduction of the Mesozoic era, according to evolutionary theory, the age of the dinosaurs, and I like dinosaurs. You have assisted me in the excavation of actual dinosaur bones, correct? A number of times. A lot of fun. <laughs> We've labored much together. Yes, we have together. And <clears throat> then at the close of this Mesozoic era, uh, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous periods, then we come to the introduction of the Cenozoic era, or the era of mammals, beginning with shrew-like creatures and evolving through the primates, ultimately to man, about two and a half million years ago, and then a few tens of thousands of years ago, according to this theory, Homo sapien, and now uh, just a fewer tens of thousands of years ago, according to this theory, uh, we have Homo sapien sapien, modern intelligent man. So in a nutshell, this Tower of Time is the paradigm, is the Bible of evolutionary theory, and is assumed to be true. Mm -hmm. Now that we have that background, let's see, let's crunch some numbers. Okay. All right, Professor, would you take <coughs> us to class? And I want this class to know you will not be bored with what you have to hear. Well, before we start with the first poster, it occurred to me a few years ago that uh, there is an area that creationists and evolutionists can't agree on, and okay. that is what our current world population is, which is approximately six and a half billion. I mean, it inches upward steadily. But uh, that's the last published date that I've, I remember saying, about six and a half billion people. Okay. So it's, in essence, it's a case of a math problem that you start with the answer and you ask the question then in reverse, well, what problem gives you that for the answer? And we have the evolutionary scenario that you've just pointed out, but there's also another competing view, and that is the biblical worldview. And we see the Bible as an accurate history book. It yes. certainly has been confirmed in archeology span over 25,000 archaeological sites that are mentioned in Scripture that, frankly, were uh, doubted very seriously, have all been confirmed. There's never been anything found in archaeology that refutes any Scripture. Now, so, would you state that again? This audience needs mm -hmm. to know. 25,000. Now, while the Bible doesn't name each of those, it names them, and then points within that site have been verified. So. 25,000 items or categories. Well, cities, waterways, yes. aqueducts, uh, various things like that that might be mentioned uh, that were challenged, you know, by the skeptics and so on, but they have been confirmed, and uh, there's not been a, a discovery that has refuted what Scripture says. So as time goes on, we, got, we gain more and more confidence just from the secular side yes. that it is a reliable history book, even Profound those that, statement. that may not accept what it says in the spiritual realm they say, well, but it is accurate historically. Well, so what does it say about uh, human population? Let's crunch some numbers. Let's sure. crunch some numbers. So here's a simple little chart. Now, you could go from creation, except that history book that we're referring to records a massive death event about 4,500 years ago, Correct. known as the flood of Noah's day. So there was a big interruption in the exponential growth of humans. And uh, if the Bible is true, then about that time frame, 4,500 years ago or so, human population was worse off than the whooping cranes. <laughs> we got down to eight Bad people. Bad off. Eight people. Yes, and they're named uh, Mr. and Ms. Noah, and the three sons are named, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. And so there were four couples on board the ark, if that story is true. And so when they disembarked from that, if that's true, then that was the seed population. That was the P sub O in the formula, the original population from which we've all come from. So it's a fair uh, way for us to test that theory. We've got a lot of science now where we can test it, mathematics being one of those sciences. So coming from that point in our history, the way we believe it, 4,500 years since the flood at the rate of about 2.5 children per family Correct. would yield what we find today, and that is 6.5 billion people on the planet. Which so, is the population today. That's I, right. I, I heard you give a portion of this lecture before, and someone stated, boy, that two and a half kids per family.